Blake, are you a dog person or a cat person? Uh, there's a right answer, too. Toby, I'd Thanos snap half of humanity away if it meant that I'd get five more years to my cat's life. Welcome to the Church Gear Podcast, where we pull the tech out of the booth and onto the stage to share the most outlandish stories and hidden wisdom from the tech trenches. And now, here are your hosts. I'm your host, Blake Hodges, a man who cares nothing of humanity but everything for my cat, Kylo, like the Kylo of the Wren. And I'm here with my co-host, who loves his dog, Ellie, so much, he got another one. Toby Walters. Blake, isn't it like uh, kind of the cliche that the lords of the underworld, like, you know, demons and Satan, use cats as their personal pets? Well, Toby, you know I'm a full fall girly, right? I mean, October is my favorite (laughs) holiday. I love Halloween over Christmas, so it fits. Uh, Then, uh, you know, a little preview to our company internal newsletter for September. Uh, I got it exactly right then. So you'll see that very shortly as our newsletter comes out internally. I mean, yesterday I literally wore a shirt to the director's (laughs) meeting with cats dressed up as ghosts on it. Like, (laughs) this is not a question. Sounds about right. Uh, In our family, we definitely believe that uh, dogs are better than cats. We kind of think that cats are dumb. Now, my daughter does love cats. But and the you rest hate of us, your first dog. But my first dog eats its own poop. So That's what dogs do. Me? So uh, and cats cover their own poop. They don't even get taught that. <laughs> I'm serious. Bring a kitten into your house. It's wild. They know how to do it. So uh, our daughter begged us for the last three years to get a second dog, and we kept saying no and putting it off, saying no and putting it off. Well, we finally took the plunge this weekend, and I said this time we're going to pick a dog that I like. So we got this, uh, we rescued a um, black doodle and his name is Harvey and he is the most gentle creature that you've ever met. He just sort of lays there and lets you pet him and that's about it. So uh, I do like, um, you like Harvey more? Yeah, a lot more. But so my wife was at lunch yesterday and that was just two days after we adopted our, our new dog, Harvey, and she got a call from a number she didn't recognize. And so she let it go to voicemail. And when she got out of lunch, she listened to her voicemail and it was the Williamson County animal shelter saying, we have your dog. And you said, well, I'm sending John Wick after you. <laughs> so what had happened, we left our new dog out on our back, like screened in patio and had locked the door, but it had broken through the screen, started wandering the neighborhood and didn't have our name on his collar yet because we just got him. And so one of our neighbors kindly called the animal rescue and said, have a dog, a stray here. And so the, you know, dog catcher came and picked him up, took him back to the rescue, and then he's microchipped. And so they called the uh, adoption center that we got him from and told the adoption center, hey, we have this dog. It's microchipped for your organization. Do you know who the owner is? So they said, yes, we do. They just adopted this dog and so this adoption center calls my wife and begins to give her like a lecture on caring for animals well (laughs) she said she was horrified like she's such a rule follower that's her nightmare and so you know she's getting kind of like the third degree from this organization and she's just like dude we left him on the back deck we just got him he doesn't like his collar doesn't have our name on it yet. So, Blake, it's kind of like when we adopted you here at Church Gear, like how long did it take you to become, you know, comfortable with the environment and, you know, to the point where you didn't pee in the house and all that stuff? I mean, I'm still doing it. I just got better at hiding it. <laughs> and the microchip you gave me, very uncomfortable, <laughs> but, you know, whatever. And I keep waiting for health bolt data to come from that microchip. But, dude, Blake, whatever's coming from from inside of you is just, it's not good information. I'll tell you, though, who's got a great microchip game. It's the Lifetime Director and Discoverer of the Fountain of Youth. Um, He's from the Church of 1122, Andrew Hofstadter. Andrew, welcome to the show, man. Hey, guys. Glad to be here. And he's not a Lifetime Director. He's a Lifetime Tech Director. That's right. Lifetime Tech Director, even though he does it. He looks like 16. He just put those glasses and hat on. I was going to say maybe 22, but like that face looks like he does a you know, supermodel level skincare routine every morning. That's the fountain of youth he found. Andrew, are you this young or is Zoom just being very kind to you today? Zoom is being very kind, but I've also always been told I have a baby face. So here we are. So uh, Blake, what do people, so if they describe Andrew as a baby face, what do they describe you? 
Uh, you know, I'm somewhere between the mix of a an old man and a drunken fool. I feel like you have the outards of a 19 year old's but the innards of like an 87 year old. Okay, you want me to tell you a real story? Jared Togger sent me a text the other day of Hank Williams drinking a beer, making fun of my new profile picture of the symbol I did at the beach. And he was like, you are him. And I said, we talk about that being my dad all the time. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, fun fact, I've hung out with and gone to church with Hank Williams granddaughter a couple times. She is uh, good friends with our neighbor. So did I say Hank Williams? I mean, the guy Hank from... Um, What's the what's the show with the four dudes? Um, we say we say it's my dad all the time. King of the Hill. King of the Hill. So not Hank Williams. You Hank from King of the Hill. What's his last name? on King of the Hill. I don't know, but Hank okay. Williams is like Whatever. a was one of the original country singer like superstars. Okay. I definitely didn't mean him. Blake, we are not cutting this out. And uh, listening audience, please, please light up Blake online for I'm, thinking that. Hank from King of the Hill is Hank Williams. There's not a lot of Hanks out there. All right, let's get back to Five Truths and a Lie, <laughs> our weekly game where we introduce our guest with five truths and one lie about him, and me and Toby try to guess. Number one, he's mic'd up Mike Pence. I feel like every other guest has worked with some yep. presidential high, high-level he, ranking candidate. He, he should have said that he's mic'd a mic before. Yeah, there um, you go. Number two, ran monitors for Celine Dion. Blake, do you know who Celine Dion is? I don't, but my heart will go on. Oh, oh Number okay. three, married his high school sweetheart. Well, he's currently in high school. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's Number not four, fair never broken a bone. This yeah. is one of our most common. Yeah. Uh, number five, shortest time at a job is 7.5 years. Wow. He did say a lifetime tech director, so I guess he's had two jobs since he's 15 now. Number six, he's never had surgery. Now that the broken bone, I feel like look like they should be a pair, but I bet one of them is the lie. You that have, is tricky. Do you have any that uh, you lean towards? I just feel like never broken a bone and never have surgery. I do. F- I'm feeling you there where one could be a lie, one, one not. You want to take one and I'll take the other? Yeah, you go first. I'll say that he has broken a bone. And I'll say that I didn't think that either was a lie and I wanted to mislead you. I'm going to go with Rand Monitors for <laughs> Celine Dion. Great. All right, Andrew, what's the lie? Okay. The lie is I've never run monitors for Celine. Oh my gosh. She doesn't go to churches. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> it's fair. Okay. Tell us about <laughs> Blake. You're fired for winning that one and for tricking me. Is that two firings? Man. Yes. All right. <laughs> tell us about so my. So I guess you're rehired because a double negative. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, that broke my brain that two negatives made yeah. a pot. Yeah. I still remember in class being like, all right, you drive negative three, negative five. I don't have $40. Okay. Wow. It's stupid. It is so stupid. What you said is very stupid. So, all right. At me. Give me an explanation, math teachers. Okay. So, tell us about Miking Mike Pence. So, we, back at my last church, we had a a massive political event when he was running with uh, Trump. And he came in to do the sermon, and we had to get uh, VIP clearance and all the, there's like four people allowed in the back room with him. And, had to wand people at the doors. It was the strangest church event I've ever been to in my life, but put a mic on them and what, here we are. What state do you live in? Florida. Hmm. Okay. I guess that makes kind of sense. Was the church putting the event on or were they just renting the space? No, we were putting it on. It was in place of our Sunday morning. Oh, service. wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. How did you feel about that? I didn't love it. Uh, still <laughs> don't, but... Here we are. I needed you to say that before I could say this. <laughs> Remember, we are apolitical on this show. Well, that's, Mike. I don't care if it's Mike Pence or I can't say your name, Harris, whoever. Kamala? Sure. I, I always think I'm going <laughs> to mess it up. No church services. That's super weird to me. That's just, that's just me. Yeah. Yeah. I don't care if you're the Green Party. That's weird. Great. Was it cool miking him or was it just like, this is just another dude? It was just another guy. Uh, there was a lot of people spectating it though. It was like, six people standing around them as oh. I'm trying to mic. <gasps> so they're probably like ready to shoot you in case mm-hmm. you go crazy. Man, that's wild. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But so, uh, you married your, times. your high school sweetheart. So you guys have been married, what, like a year and a half now? Uh, we just celebrated, uh, 12 years. Dang man. How old are you for real? 35. <gasps> what the heck? Blake, can you imagine if you looked like that at 35? I don't look like that now. No. <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Well done, Andrew. 
Yeah. We yeah. dated for four and a half years and then got married after she graduated college and married since uh, 2012. Yeah. That's adorable. Like how long you been married now? Uh, seven years. Do, do you think she's going to keep you till 12? Oh, sorry. I meant that. That's how long I've been married to my best friend. Uh, sh- I've been married. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Seven years. Yeah. I think she'll keep me uh, until my life insurance policy runs out. Oh, there you go. So. Yeah. She'll cash in right when it's time. I mean, a pretty good policy. Yeah. Uh, let's see. What else? Never broke a bone. Okay. Are you at your current job? Is that the only job you've had? I'm assuming that's why it's 7.5 years. No, I was at my last job. So I've only had two jobs. Um, both at a church. I started, uh, as that was my first job. Um, and so I was there for almost 12 years and I've been here for seven and a half mm. coming up on eight and that's December. a loyal guy. He's breaking the millennial stats. Like he's the yeah, guy totally. on the statistical chart. That's the uh, little outlier guy. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. with, uh, just two jobs, I guess your background snapshot that we're asking for is going to be just that a snapshot, but, uh, tell us how, you know, quick story of how you got into production and then what led to being at 1122 now. Yeah. So I started out in IT, uh, working in help desk, uh, very quickly realized that was not the end all be all for me. Um, <laughs> I just swapped like four printers in one day and I thought this is not, this isn't it. You needed that many uh, boat anchors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Every desk had a printer on it. It was kind of insane. Um, and I started, I switched over to what we called media and started editing radio broadcast for traditional FM radio. Um, and then was there and then the Lord just kind of put me in the right spot at the right time. And, um, I ended up moving into the audio director role at my last place and then took over all of media uh, and broadcast there. And I had a really great boss that took uh, a b- pretty big risk on me. Uh, he hired me full time as the audio director. I'd been mixing, I think, less than a year. Mm. Uh, and he hired me at a mega church to run the audio team at, I don't know, 19 years old. Um, and he let me fail. He let me try things and fail and learn from it and uh, get better every time. And then I ended up coming to 1122. Uh, at the end of 2016 and came on kind of with the goal of launching campuses. We were launching about one a year in that season. And I kind of partnered with a uh, colleague to help run the weekend execution. Um, For a season, he moved out into uh, film world to do more studio stuff. I ended up running the team, uh, the weekend execution team. Uh, or weekend services and we that was until about a year and a half ago and then we started launching faster than we can um, think and we moved me into a new role where i just get to focus on new campuses um, both portable brick and mortar um, our, all of our permanents uh, prison campuses so that's the role i get to sit in now been here seven and a half years and and some days it feels like an eternity and other days it feels like I started yesterday. And 1122 has been growing like wildfire. Uh, you guys, you know, one of the fastest growing in the nation. How many campuses do you have now? And I remember you telling me kind of the, you know, your lead pastor's vision. What's the, what's the goal for launching campuses in the next decade or so? I don't know that we necessarily have a goal. Um, we're currently at 12 campuses. We launch our 13th campus uh, in October of this year. Um, and our, our goal, I don't know that we have a number on it, but our goal is to continue putting campuses in neighborhoods where people already are. Um, it's a unique, uh, view on it in my opinion. Um, and so as we grow and as we open campuses, the Lord just keeps bringing people. Um, one of the things we say around here is we, uh, want to make room for one more. Um, and so we put campuses out and open up seats for people's one mores to come hear the gospel and, uh, discover and deepen a relationship with him. I love that. And, uh, with how many, you know, campuses, I- I'm assuming unless you guys are gazillionaires that you've got to make uh, critical decisions on production gear when you're launching that many campuses. And you said, uh, one of your values is excellence without excess 
And so how does that play out in what you guys do? And then, um, you know, are there ways in which other churches, you see a lot of excess that you wish they could make different decisions about? Yeah. Yeah. It's one of our uh, core values. It's, it's one of the more difficult ones because both sides of it are subjective. Uh, excellent to me and excess to me are very different than our COOs, excellent and excess. Um, and so what I, the general rule of thumb I've always used is if I'm not utilizing 80% of the feature set of the gear, then I don't need the gear. Hmm. There's something else out there that I can better utilize. And so some of those things play out in, um, in specific brands, like, uh, do I need the Ross video switcher or can I get away with a black magic constellation? Um, it's significantly cheaper, similar feature set. Uh, and does the job that we need it to do. Um, and so we are constantly, as we launch, dollar amounts go up, like the gear costs more, labor costs more, and we're always trying to like, as churches do, trying to whittle it down as tight as we can um, to make, to be good stewards of what the Lord's given us. Like um, what percentage of your feature set do you think we utilize here at Church Gear? That's the sad thing is you utilize 110%. There's just <laughs> only a half broken feature on it. <laughs> you just keep pressing that button. I'm like the Avion that's only got one channel, but they're like, we only need the one. <laughs> and uh, we actually get to tap into your feature set in this season because we're doing a fantasy football league with Church Gear. And so oh, this tech, is yeah. outside of outside of Church Gear, you, I feel like you have two feature sets, which is you love mixology and you love fantasy football. Tech, yeah, I do. And I hope that you're in the Church Gear Fantasy League if you're hearing this. And if not, next year you'll have a chance to compete to get in one of our two leagues. Uh, Andrew, are you uh, an NFL guy at all? No, I grew up in Jacksonville, so we have the Jags here. Yeah, uh, They aren't the best. We're hopeful. <laughs> We're hopeful that this year could be our year. Could it be but their no, year, Blake? I'd say that y'all's odds are better than they've been in a bit. Losing Calvin Ridley is pretty tough. Um Hey, you know, I think you kind of gave us one answer, but I'm going to dig just a little further Yeah, because I do. really think this is a great question. Like you just gave a really practical rule. It's not often in a podcast I can feel, oh, I'll probably clip that. That'll be a post for this. Do you have any other practical rules in addition to your, if you're not using 80% of it, you're probably not going to buy it. Anything else you use to guide you um, to have excellence without excess? Uh, it's not necessarily a rule, but I, we went through one, a pretty significant project here. And our uh, COO and I just kept butting heads. It was like, we need color changing house lights. No, you don't. It's not worth the money. And we just kept butting heads left and right, whether it was um, electrical needs, whether it was equipment, whether it was uh, what the room was going to be utilized for, like giving up 4,000 square feet for a studio. He's like, we could use that for offices or for whatever. And so we just kept butting heads. And I, at the end of the project, I was like, this isn't working. What do we do? And he said, it's your job to make it excellent. And it's my job to make it no excess. Mm -hmm. And it clicked. It was like, oh, I just need people surrounding me that are fighting for the opposite thing. And then it, it's not personal. It's like, he's not attacking me and my ability to design a thing or my ability to um, cast vision for a thing. He's attacking the dollar amount and making sure that I've done my research and my due diligence to make sure that there's the feature set that we need is actually what we're getting and not the feature set that we want for five years from now. Yeah, I know that this is a sort of a common topic that comes up when we talk to our friends at different churches. They say, you know, it'd be really helpful to talk about the relationship between production and the exec pastor, or the COO, like whoever's making the money decisions, because there can of often be that tension. Book it. That's our next series. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, you've, it seems like you've realized like, okay, we have different roles here, but we're working towards the same thing. Um, do you guys like, you know, what's like a buddy buddy thing you do to to release the tension blake like go out shoot something or go out and have a beer or you know play some fantasy football and yeah. <laughs> beat each other and then you know rag each other for it so does it just take time to realize that you know you're on the on the same team even though you have different roles or how does that work in your relationship with him i mean currently he's my direct 
report. So I work for him. Um, and that season we did not. And so for me, it's time with him. Like it's time spent together forming a relationship, um, knowing that he trusts me and I trust him in those seasons. So when he's asking something or asking us to cut something back 50%, it's not because he is out to get me or to say, well, production doesn't need to spend money or production's the most expensive department or whatever the weekly thing is. He's asking it just to, as a second check on me to make sure that I've done my due diligence to do it well and to steward well. And do you guys do anything to teach one another, you know, to, to help one another understand your world? Like, have you spent any time like explaining production to him, like even having him sit with the team on a Sunday morning and then vice versa, like you get a lesson in diving into his spreadsheets and see how money flows throughout the entire organization. Yeah. I think on both ends, he is very active in our um, services and our weekend execution. And so he gets to see the, uh, backside of everything that we do. And probably once a month, he's bringing something to me saying, Hey, I saw this talk more. Like, what are we doing here? Why are we doing it? What was that? Um, or asking the question, how do we handle an overflow room? And so he's constantly asking questions, um, to just educate himself. Uh, and then I'm always bringing stuff to him of, Hey, this is why we need X, Y, or Z, or this is why this system is what we decided to put in place, um, to help educate him on that side. And because I work for him, I have to live in spreadsheets and all the like, he is an extremely detailed human. Um, and he just, he thinks so different than me because he's an oper like an operations guy. Um, he's, he just has a ton of experience and uh, so I'm, it's a good balance between the two of us because I'm on the artsy fartsy tech worship <laughs> side. And then he's on the, um, operations. We have a checklist. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah. That's great, Blake. I don't know that I've ever heard of an, of a tech director reporting to the exec pastor. Well, he's not quite, you're more of like a, a project manager, right? Yeah. So my title technically right now is, um, mobile and launch project manager. And so when I made that shift about a year and a half ago, that my title changed from tech director over, um, I'm still heavily involved in the production team, but we've hired a tech director. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, uh, to run the weekend execution piece of it. You know, what I hear in that is like, they just had to get their relationship better. And that came out of the pastor series was just, you can't, you got to get the reps in, you know, you yep. can't fake reps. And it I'm takes like, time. Maybe we just need to microwave these relationships better. Like when you get a new direct report, you got to go in a cabin in the woods with them for two days. Cause after a trip, you're buddies. That's true. Like spend, uh, what do we decide a road trip is? Like it has to be how oh, long? We were talking about this on our recent trip to MXU. Cause that's like three hours. It's not a road trip. Was it four or five hours? It depended on the person is anywhere from four to eight. I think. Yeah. You got to take a road trip with yeah. them. That's the new law. So, Andrew, give us some helpful advice for smaller churches working with very limited budgets that are trying to make gear decisions. Um, you know, do you have helpful tips when you're, you know, looking at a very small budget and need to get some gear to make your Sunday happen? Or do you just rob the bank down the store? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I would not advise that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, for me, one of the things I'm constantly trying to learn is don't, I don't need to aim for 10 years from now. Um, I need to aim for what the next couple big moves are. Um, so for us, that plays out in a two to three year window. Um, we are quick to change uh, processes, quick to change gear. But I have the first campus I was part of building here. There is speaker like for uh, guitar cabs. There's speak on connectors everywhere. And we don't use any of them because we don't use speaker cabs anymore. And so it's like we put in all this money and infrastructure into little things like that. And by the time we go to use them, they're obsolete. And so if you aim too far out, you get paralyzed by the, uh, the dreaming and you miss what you're actually supposed to be doing. There could be a $2,000 piece of gear that will do the job that you need to do right now versus the $20,000 piece of gear that in your mind, we'll get you another 15 years, but in reality, it's going to get you 
six to seven, and then it's going to be obsolete again, and you're going to be in the same boat. What led you to shortening your window? Because I kind of hear a range from a lot of people like, buy your second LED wall first. Um, Don't buy the thing that you want, buy the thing the church needs. Like, I just hear a lot of things that it doesn't seem like there's a hard and fast rule. So what got you guys to deciding like two to three year window? I think it's just the pace. Um, As an organization, we don't do 10 year plans. Um, We're constantly every year we uh, reevaluate our lead pastor brings um, a vision to our staff and to the church of what the Lord is calling our church to do. Um, And so we take it one step at a time. We have campuses uh, popping up. I think there's five projects opening next year. And so it's a lot of projects to see all on a 12 month time span. And so I think our pace is dictating the two to three years out because a lot for us can change in three years. We could be, we're 12 campuses. Now we could be at 20, 25 campuses in a three year window. Um, and so I think that's, what's dictated it for us is just pace. That sounds right. So the pace kind of sets the window time limit. If your church is growing at a, exorbitant amount of rate. Like sometimes you just got to only look at a year ahead. Yeah. And I think, you know, what I heard in there and correct me if I'm wrong, it's, it's very tempting to like overthink it and want to get the, the sexy choice that you see the big church down the road getting, but you know, get your vision correct on your size and your scope and what your church really needs now, um, rather than getting lost in stuff that, you know, all of us want. Would you want a Ferrari, Blake? Heck no. A car is the quickest degrading asset on the market. <laughs> so you're already thinking like a small church. You know what doesn't go down in value is Pappy. Give me a whole, <laughs> give me that much in a Ferrari. It'll be worth way more in the future. Okay. So, um, you know, well, okay, Toby, you just scrolled past my question. Oh, you had a question. <laughs> you I'm nope, sorry. You, your turn. Your turn. Because you I'm moving to the next question, Blake. Okay, that's, that's fine. fine. So, Andrew, I talk about your guys' uh, broadcast auditorium a lot when I go visit other churches. So, Blake, um, as you've visited churches, you know that oftentimes if you're going to get the full tech tour, like put on your walking shoes, you're getting about 10,000 steps as you just go from, you know, the back room to the you know, way behind the stage to up in the third floor. Like it's spread My out Fitbit all over the typically place. tells me to stop walking before I finish. I don't think yeah. I've ever finished one. So uh, visiting 1122, um, you took me to the tech booth in the auditorium. And then Blake in the back of the tech booth is like a Hobbit door. And you walk through the Hobbit door and you're in the entire creative suite. Is this like and an actual, right like it looks like a Hobbit door, like it's stylized or it's just like it's a small door? Is it shorter, Andrew, or is it a full-size door? It's not, but that does feel like a missed opportunity on our yeah. part. So you guys put your entire production suite under the stadium seating in the back of your auditorium and it connects directly to your tech booth. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Just brilliant. Isn't that super challenging? People always talk about mixing like in the back middle of the room typically. Am I wrong there? Like... Well, tell us about it, Andrew. Is it, uh, you know, was that the right decision for you guys? Do you regret anything? Would you have done anything different? As far as the layout, I think it's worked really, really well for us. Um, Mixing, you're in the middle of the room mixing because you're on the front lip of uh, the rake. So you're literally front to back. You're in the middle of the room. um, And it, I mean, the room is designed really, really well. We worked with an integration company and they're amazing. So Um, like 50% is on the floor and then halfway back, you have the start of the stadium seating where the tech booth is. And then mm -hmm. under that stadium seating is the entire production suite. Does that make sense? That's a good good mental picture, Toby. Thank you for walking people through that. Yeah. So the the booth cuts into the front of the rake and then we've got the Hobbit door uh, that goes back into, that's where video control room is our main rack room, broadcast audio. Um, all of the creative like studio areas, um, audio studio, video studio, uh, all the edit bays. IT is right there, which is amazing. Is if something goes sideways, IT is four steps away from everything that we need. Yeah. What was the why for that? Like any particular reason, or was it just like this is a space saver? Was there a tech reason? Uh, there wasn't a tech reason other than close proximity. Um, I think you win every time if you're close to the stuff that you need. If you can keep your team close, I think you win. 
um it's less i mean practically it's less cable run we've got to run fiber because of the distance we've got to run fiber between our two rack rooms so if we had to run fiber for every piece of gear going back and forth it would just get ridiculously expensive um but we didn't want to take out good seats we didn't want to block good seats um we wanted to fit 3,000 seats in that space uh when we started building it it was a hobby lobby and so we took the roof off went from 20 something feet to i think it's 62 and on the high side or 61 on the high side and so it was how do we get maximum number of seats in the in the footprint that we can we talked about doing balconies and we talked about doing um partial rakes and it just it's where we landed maximum seat count um and then all of the stuff that we don't necessarily need people seeing all went up under the rake and then we kept all of our public viewable spaces or what we call the lounge uh, nursing moms kids access uh, all that stuff front facing to the lobby so they never they see a double door that's unmarked to get into the studio toby do you think that like when people apply to work there uh, on the benefits package, it's like, hey, introverts, work underground away from everyone. <laughs> yeah, like in a bunker. <laughs> that that sounds like an, uh, you know, a benefit. And then they don't have to walk by people in between like, you know, the tech booth, the production suite, broadcast. So they just get to stay down in the bunker. And when a mistake happens, you don't get to just all stare in the back of the room at them. <laughs> this is sounding like a big perk. I mean, you still got a front of house guy standing at the tech booth. So anything that goes wrong, they're just going to assume he did it. Oh, I thought he was underground with them. No, the so they still have the audio, the you know, the okay, okay. This is making a lot more sense. Front now. of house, but, yeah, front like, of house, audio, lighting, our producer, cam offs, um, and occasionally CG will all be out in the room at the front of house booth. You mentioned that the integrator that you guys worked with, you guys really liked them, and we always have people asking us for recommendations. Also, we can cut this, Toby, if we need to, but you want to shout them out? Who were they? Yeah, the guys at Clark in Atlanta, uh, they're amazing. Uh, they We've been partners with them for, oh, since 2017. Uh, we signed our first contract with them. Uh, and there's something pretty amazing about partnering with an integration company because they begin to know our DNA and they understand the things that uh, we are going to desire and want. They also see the growth and what we're trying to do and accomplish. and they also hold to the excellence without excess concept for us. So I don't have to go through and redline 400 pages of gear that I don't need because <laughs> mm. they're doing that version one before they ever give it to me. Yeah. I really want to make our ultimate list of integrators one day. You know, it's, it's a dream. I'm just saying, but, I, yeah. I think people would love it. Yeah. Clark does great work. They work with a lot of the biggest churches in the country and you know, they're trusted for good reason. Yeah. Um, so uh, obviously we talked about a lot that goes right. Do you have any stories where everything went wrong or almost wrong? Do you have any good disaster moments? Oh yeah. Um, so the, our main building, uh, San Pablo is the campus. It is it's our broadcast location. We built it. It was Hobby Lobby, took the roof off 3000 seats. We get to open like the opening service. And every time we launch campus, our, uh, whoever the campus pastor is, San Pablo is our lead pastor. The first thing that happens in our service is they get on stage and they pray. Um, and we don't want to do anything else until we've prayed. And so our lead pastor walks out on stage and flips on his mic. Uh, we keep his mic with a mute switch and he goes on it and the battery's dead. And so I'm looking at workbench panicking or I am 80 feet away from the stage at this point. And he flips it back, still nothing, flips it one more time, still nothing, pulls it off his belt, looks at it, there's no light, throws it in his pocket, grabs a handheld from worship faster. And all I'm thinking is, this is it. It's been a good run. I'm out. <laughs> I'm getting fired. And he grabs the mic, he prays, uh, and I walked back. While he's praying, I'm running through the auditorium to go meet him in the back to figure out what happened on this pack. And I get back there and he just stares at me and hands me his pack. It's 
it's just dead. We'd put AAA batteries in there. Uh, we'd never run it for more than 40 minutes, 45 minutes at a time. It was a new Axiant pack that we didn't have the rechargeable for. And uh, by the time we handed it to him, to the time he hit stage, it died as he was walking on stage. And it was the only time I've looked at our lead pastor and said, I just need you to trust me that it's going to work when you go back out there. Mm. So we got him a new pack. And he said and afterwards he told me he's like andrew it took everything in me to not stand on stage and say we just built a 35 million dollar building and yet in true 1122 fashion we still don't have a working mic oh <laughs> like, thank you for not saying that but it was it was terrible we've had sewage um uh sewage line break in our sub cavity Ooh. at launch it's fine all the way through construction we hit opening day and sewage breaks like the sewage lines there's actual sewage coming out of a sub cavity no. during our night service yeah we've we've had a every project there's something yeah it is great see i it's, would assume because you moved into a hobby lobby that the holiness would still be there to cover all the disasters but you know, if you'd moved into a Walmart, I would understand this. But Hobby Lobby, well, come on, guys. We expect more from Well, it, it was a Walmart before Hobby Lobby. Oh, so. oh wow. It's, yeah. It's yeah. that leftover Walmart sewage, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> I'm kind of hearing his story, you know, running for with batteries. Should we have like a first aid kit, but for tech? So it's got like batteries and gaff tape <laughs> and a monster energy drink. like 100%. And then... um. Uh, the paddles that because he was worried, you know, the pack is dead, but also he's worried my relationship with my pastor is dead. Maybe he has those paddles where he can shock his relationship with his pastor back to life. There's also an apology card in there. <laughs> it's just already signed. <laughs> it's pre-written. <laughs> the tech emergency pack. Okay. Um, well, Toby, you ready for a tech takeaway? Uh, hit me with it, Blake. Oh, not from me. Not oh, from me. Thank goodness. Uh, the Lord knew better than that. Put me in a different seat. Andrew, if you were going to give us a tech takeaway, man, to tell a whole room of uh, church techs and production people, what would you say to the group? Uh, there's always somebody smarter than you that's walked the road you're on. Um, you've got, there's, I mean, the church tech world is very small. And so there's always somebody going through the same thing you're going through, dealing with the same relationship with your pastor, XP, um, or operations guy. There's always somebody that's either walked it or is walking it that you can talk to and get advice from. And uh, as soon as you isolate, it's bad news. You know who that reminds me of is our good friend, Bill Firesheets, where he talked about <laughs> always finding the tech directors and meeting them around you. Oh, sorry, Justin. We know you as Bill now. One of our people internally <laughs> called him Bill on accident and it's changed his name. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Andrew, that's really good, man. Uh, you got anything you want to plug other than the sewage? Uh, you know, as we wrap, <laughs> <laughs> he's not the first church that's happened to you. I know someone else yeah. has said that on this show. Um, you got anything you want to point people towards? Yeah, uh, if you're building a new building and you can't reach it easily with a lift, fight hard for catwalks. Mm. Uh, it's, yeah, we're in that boat. We opted to not put catwalks in. You're never putting them in after the fact, despite that it's possible. You're just not gonna, and it is hard to get to things. And even though it's LED or even though it's a lifetime warranty, stuff still dies and you still have to get to it. So how do you... I love it. He's just, he's plugging catwalks. Yeah, this yeah. is amazing. This yeah. is our best plug we've ever had. Totally. So how do you get there now that you don't have a catwalk? So we, we bring in this giant boom arm and we have to, we have fixed seating and we have to remove all the fixed seating. We have a roll up on the side and that will get to 70% of the room. And then up over the rake, if we need to get to those house lights, we literally have to be, build scaffolding up to get to wow. it. Do you have any video of y'all doing this before? No, we don't want to document. <laughs> please, please send this to us. I will post this. This sounds so fun. Also, notice that it's a catwalk, Toby, because cats are superior. Uh, you need to have the catwalk. Mm -hmm. A dog walk. What is that? Uh, exercise, which I'm allergic to. And Andrew, I'm vi I'm envisioning, and I don't know if you guys seen these YouTube videos, like these giant drones that people stand on, and they can like fly around on drones. Oh yeah. If you can get one of those. Yeah, it could work. Yeah. Then you fall and the little wing just cut your whole body like a blender. Oh my yeah, gosh. Yeah, until you drop a safety cable and it yeah. breaks the drum. But that that's just good content. Did you yeah. Do either of you guys see the drone they used in Ukraine recently? They now have 
a drone that can drop molten lava on troops. <laughs> I was like, this is the end. I don't want to, this is too much. It wow. was terrifying. Yeah. So you can surely get a drone to fix you up to the tech booth. I'm sure. Yeah. Well, Andrew, this has been quite an episode. Um, <laughs> quite a thing to end on, but man, we appreciate you coming on the show. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me, guys. Hey, listeners. We're introducing a segment called Church Tech Confessionals. This is a time for any church tech to anonymously confess the worst thing they've ever done in church production. Here's one now. One time my executive pastor upper decked the green room bathroom right before services. Hey, if you have your own three to five minute church tech confessional, record it and send it to podcast at churchgear.com. And don't worry, we'll apply a voice changer and you'll be 100% anonymous. Your pastor will never know. Thanks for hanging out with us. We hope to see you back next week for more absurd stories, tech takeaways, and overall buffoonery here at the Church Gear Studios. Blake, uh, just remember there's always somebody smarter than you co-hosting the podcast with you. That's a real A-host thing to say. Um, But my plan B is to say, hey, you should share this episode with your friends. Uh, Text it to them. Send it in your tech group chat. Be like, hey, you got to hear this episode. Yeah, that's a pretty smart thing to say. You know what's smarter, though? Dogs. Dogs.